Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and we're with Erin Hunt today. Erin's in Ottawa at uh, an office called, her place of work called Minds Action Canada, which is an organization devoted to uh, trying to uphold the Landmines Treaty, among other things. But she has, she's a woman of many parts who goes frequently to Geneva to take part in many other negotiations of of things that will make us safer if all goes well. So it's it's always a treat to talk to Erin. Thank you for being with me today, Erin. And I want to get caught up. Erin's uh, work has to do with the Land Mines uh, Treaty that was negotiated some years ago. And her office is in the business of trying to make sure that everybody in the world adheres to that treaty and stops using land mines. So, mm -hmm. hi, Erin. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Right, let's talk about landmines. Tell me what a landmine is. Matter of fact, I'm not sure I would recognize one if I were about to step on it. So That's the problem with landmines is nobody can see them before they are um, killed or injured. So well, even if I saw one, I wouldn't know it was something I should watch out for. Exactly. Most of the time they don't actually look that scary. So a landmine is any um, explosive device that's designed to be set off by the presence or proximity or the touch of a person. So they can have a bunch of different styles. Um, some are, were manufactured um, in large factories before the Ottawa Treaty was signed in the 90s. Mm -hmm. Some were made um, one by one by different armed groups um, using regular household things and some are made almost at an industrial scale by armed groups but the big thing you need to know about landmines is they are indiscriminate because anyone who is touches them or is nearby can set them off and you know you just said something that I want to stop you because you you evoked a question in my mind I sure. hear about IEDs Mm -hmm. I don't know what that stands for, except I think it's, you said some bombs are made just by hand, like kitchen, mm -hmm. kitchen com uh, components. Uh, are IEDs landmines, and what, what's the difference? And, you know. yeah. yeah, so IEDs, it stands for Improvised Explosive Device, landmines. Um, because remember the landmine definition is how they're detonated. So some sort of um, homemade explosive devices, improvised explosive devices can be landmines, um, but others can be like um, command detonated. They could be de detonated by a, a timer. They could be detonated uh, by someone using a cell phone signal. They could be detonated by some, uh, a suicide um, vest type um, IED. So there's some of them could even be bombs from air uh, helicopters. We do see that a bit in Syria where the Assad regime is dropping oil barrels full of explosives on cities. Um, so that's an IED. That's an improvised explosive device. Um, but it's essentially just a dumb bomb. Uh, it's, so you scatter these land of mines around or you bury them. Is that, mm -hmm. I say you, as if Aaron <laughs> out there. <laughs> yeah, definitely not me. But um, yeah, so there's different kinds. There are some that can be dropped from a plane. Um, there are a lot that are buried. Um, there are some that are on like a spike with a trip wire. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of different kinds of mines. But yeah, the, the big commonality, what's important is, can they tell the difference between a soldier and a civilian? Um, and if they're set off by whoever touches them, they can't tell the difference, and they're a landmine that's banned by the Ottawa Treaty. Uh, even, even cows could set them off, right? Exactly. That's actually a very large problem um, in Zimbabwe, where there's a lot of families that are taking have cattle, and there's a big minefield belt near one of the borders there that hasn't been cleared yet. And so families are losing their cattle, which essentially means they're losing their whole wealth. I don't really normally deal with cows, but I understand that it's kind of hard to get them to go exactly where you want them to go. <laughs> oh. Sort yeah. of like cats. <laughs> yes, cats yes. Cat on a yes. leash very well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. 
uh, okay, so obviously these are very nasty things because mm -hmm. they stay there, right? They do, yeah. So um, they're, they're indiscriminate and they don't know when the war ends. So you don't know um, how long they've been there or if people are going home after a conflict that could still be a danger for them. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do all of them last indefinitely or do some of them go bad after a few years? And if so, how would you know whether it's gone bad or not? That's a very good question. Um, so they do, some of them do eventually sort of go bad, but the problem is you never know. So any landmine encountered has to be treated like it's live. So there is, there are people, um, thousands of people around the world who are, their job is to find the landmines and take them out of the ground or diffuse them. So if they find something that is a landmine, they have to treat it like it's live which is obviously much more um, time consuming than it would be to just, you know, pick up a piece of trash on the ground. Sounds um, like an awful job. Uh, it must be really scary. Uh, how dangerous is it to, to have the role of being a D minor? It, yeah, D minor is the word, yeah. Um, most of the people I know who do this, they, they know it, it can be dangerous. They're exceptionally well-trained and have very solid operating procedures. Like there are ways that the sector has figured out how to be safest. Uh, and one thing that I found really interesting is I was talking with one of my colleagues from a British organization that does do landmine clearance. And he was saying that their insurance, like their workplace corporate insurance policy, um, they're, the company has sort of said that they're probably safer than the average British construction firm. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. So, because there are a lot of very dangerous jobs out there that we don't think are dangerous. So, but a job that deals with live explosives, we know it's dangerous. So we're going to set up a lot of really strict rules about how you do this and how you clear everything and how far away each D minor has to be from the other person what happens in every situation. Um, How many people are there in the world out there trying to remove landmines these days? Oh, you're asking me to um, put out a, uh, a spoiler on a paper we're like releasing from Mines Action Canada next week. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I, um, well, I, yeah. it, I um, can't promise to keep it secret beyond Monday. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's... Uh, in total, we're looking at uh, over 18,000, but that's not, that's just from nonprofit organizations that answered a survey or a questionnaire we did recently. So there are still government um, D minors that aren't counted in there. Um, there are also UN staff that aren't counted in that, or there are some for profit companies that take um, that clear minds. So there's a lot of people that weren't included. So that number is the bare minimum. Uh huh, and they're all over the world, I guess. Well, not everywhere. I don't think any are in Toronto, but um, there are apparently there have been a lot of mines put out in the world and forgotten about or left to harm people. Yes, yeah. Um, what are the main countries that you would find um, landmines that haven't been cleared yet, and and where have the the landmines largely been removed? Okay, yeah, so there's about 60 countries and other areas that are still contaminated by landmines. Um, some of them are the ones that you think about when you, you think about landmines, like Afghanistan, Cambodia, Angola. Um, some are ones that you might not necessarily think about, uh, like Sri Lanka, Colombia, and uh, Peru and Ecuador. Uh, so we have, there's lots of countries that, that still have mines. Some of them are getting very close to being landmine free um, and some countries have already um, cleared all their landmines. I think the biggest success story um, when it comes to clearing landmines is Mozambique. Um, so when Mozambique signed the Ottawa Treaty in 1997, they, they sort of thought it was going to take them about a hundred years to, to clear their mines. Um, and, and they finished in 2014, 2015 um, and they're landmine-free now, um, which is amazing for the country because you have 
it's much safer for everyone. You can use the land for agriculture, for water, for industry. Um, it's just uh, sort of revolutionizes life in a community when you when you clear the mines from there. Well, I would think it would be one, you'd have a leg up if you if you knew where the darn things are. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, having access to a, a map or or some. Uh, some informant who had been involved in laying the landmines might be very uh, make a huge difference, wouldn't it? it did the, did uh, Mozambicans uh, is that the word? <laughs> Mo Mozambicans um, yeah. did they have a special inside information that helped speed the thing up, or or were they just especially committed to it? Um, I think it was a little bit of both. Um, and they, they do that. They ask questions. They try and find old battlefield maps or they'll talk to the community and be like, where was their fighting? Um, have you seen any mines? Um, have, where have people been hurt? Is there anywhere that you don't go because you think it's dangerous? Um, did you plant any mines? Do you remember where they were? Um, all those sorts of questions to sort of try and map out where the dangerous areas are. Mm -hmm. Are there people uh, or warriors who plant these things and really don't keep track at all? They just throw them around? Yeah, there are people that where, where they never even had a map of what they did. Yeah, all the time. Um, so a lot of non-state armed groups are not going to put down a map. Um, we are seeing a new sort of landmine emergency in the um, in the Middle East, specifically in Iraq and in Syria because of ISIS or Daesh or whatever you want to call them. Um, they were one of these non-state armed groups that has started making their own mines and they have just, everywhere that they've retreated from, they've left them very, the area very heavily contaminated. So all the people that fled, um, once they try to come home, it becomes exceptionally dangerous. And so there's um, huge communities still displaced even though like ISIS has left their homes but they just can't go home yet because the mines have made it not safe. And after the landmines treaty was negotiated and uh, so you thought you had things under control or on the way to under, uh, being under control when Daesh comes along and decides they want to do it again or some more. Yes yeah it was very frustrating um, but what sort of gives me hope about this is that they couldn't actually find, they had to make them themselves, mm -hmm. which shows that the treaty did work to some extent. Correct, yeah, so like there, there's no real international trade in landmines anymore, so mm -hmm. you, can, you can buy a lot of weapons, but this one you, you can't buy very easily. Well, are they hard to make? If you and I decided not really. we're not, that uh, for some reason we wanted one, which is, highly improbable, uh, what would we do? How, uh, how would we go about making one? And is it something that, say, the two of us could figure out and do? We probably could. I, and I have some ideas on how you could do that, but I- You'd rather not tell. <laughs> want something to put on the internet. <laughs> I quite understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll change the subject. And not talk. Okay. <laughs> tell me another thing, and that is I've heard that that animals can sniff them out or something that you can train animals or you can, I don't know. Tell um, there are two main ones. The most common one is dogs. The same way you have, you know, um, explosive detecting dogs at airports and at important events and that sort of thing. Um, those dogs can be trained to smell explosives that are in the ground. Um, so they can really help identify where mines are to be cleared. Um, and then the other animal that's, that's used a bit that always surprises people is rats. So um, not sort of like the kind of rats that I saw run across the road the other day. Um, these are larger African pouched rats. Um, but just like dogs, they can be trained and they can use their sense of smell to identify explosives. Um, so they've been used in a few countries. Um, Dogs are used obviously more often. It really just depends on what sort of terrain you're dealing with, what sort of explosives you're dealing with, whether they're the, the right tool from the demining toolbox to use. Oh, uh, is it hard on the dogs? I mean, do 
is it riskier for dogs than it is for the D minors? Uh, like the same way we have really good procedures for humans, they have really good procedures for dogs. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, like for the example, the rats don't weigh enough to ever set off a mine. Um, and uh, the dogs uh, usually are trained to stop before they reach whatever they're smelling. Um, and there's other procedures and things that they've, they've taken care of to make sure the dogs are um, safe and well cared for. They usually have a very good relationship with their, their handler. Um, when they find something, they get to play. Um, and they're, they're usually the types of dogs that like to work. Um, so the same sorts of dogs that you see here um, doing jobs. Eye like, dogs or something. So, uh, yeah, so lots of um, lots of like Malwas and German Shepherds and the, the kind of dogs you see at the airports. Would have been anything like that have been used in World War One? Yeah, so like the first sort of landmines that weren't just like booby trapped type things, but the first landmines were sort of invented in the uh, American Civil War. Um, so they were used then in World War One and World War Two, but it was sort of the the wars of liberation and the conflicts in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, and early 90s that really saw their use um, sort of proliferate and skyrocket to become what was at the time in the uh, mid 90s a global crisis. Mostly then in colonial, colonialized countries that were trying to get independence or? Um, um, somewhat. Uh, I mean, there's still, there were mines left all over Europe from World War II, um, some of which Denmark finished clearing in the past decade. Um, Would so, those have been left there on purpose or is it just discarded things that you have to watch out for? Uh, they were like specifically made minefields during World War II that just um, were um, not cleared until recently. Mm -hmm. So it, I don't think it really depended on who was fighting more so much as if there was fighting. Um, however, Canada, for example, we um, hadn't used landmines since the Korean War when we banned them. So it's possible to take part in, in conflicts, um, your own soldiers and all of that without using them. I imagine, you know, this whole thing came about as a result kind of a social movement, isn't it? A, a rather discreet social movement is so specifically targeting the use of landmines rather than just conflict and wars in general. But, you know, peace, certain bunches of peace activists got engaged with the attempt to um, make a treaty. Now, how did all that happen? Yeah, so um, where it really came from is a lot of the sort of uh, aid workers, um, humanitarians, development workers realizing that the landmines were preventing their work. The landmines were what was killing people and heart, um, injuring people. The landmines were preventing development workers from being able to like um, help increase agricultural production because you couldn't use the land. Um, so a bunch of those organizations got together with some of the human rights and um, peace organizations and said, you know what? we need to do something about the mines. We can't do anything to benefit humanity until we take care of these mines. Like they're preventing our work. They're putting us in danger. They're putting the communities we work with in danger. Um, so it started with six organizations that got together um, and it's grown now to hundreds in almost every country around the world. Um, it's called the International Campaign to Ban Landmines and it was the co-winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 1997 with its um, uh, coordinator at the time, Jody Williams. Mm -hmm. So this is- uh, Which a, Canada had a very important part to play. What yes. What is uh, unique and special about Canada's uh, contribution to this effort? Yeah, so when you have the activists, all the people from mine affected communities speaking out, that's great and that's fantastic and they worked so hard to get this into the um, the consciousness of decision makers but you do need someone to have the courage to step up um, from outside from like within the walls of power and, and uh, to take this on and 
what's incredible is that was the Canadian government role in this process. So at the time, Lloyd Axworthy was Canada's foreign minister, and he shocked the world, really, um, when at the end of the meeting that he had held in Ottawa about the problem of landmines, he delivered a challenge and said, all right, everyone, we've agreed that these are bad. Come back in a year and sign a treaty banning landmines here in Ottawa. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I know that everybody says that man really deserves huge parts of credit for what happened. And bless his heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, but now, um, so it is called the Ottawa Treaty. Yeah. yeah. And um, uh, how did it come about? Did Because my understanding is that what was special about it was that it, in a way, governments, most governments wouldn't have done it. And it wouldn't have been able to do happen in the normal procedures, the, the normal way treaties get negotiated. Uh, uh, what was different about this that uh, I believe people have uh, used the Ottawa process as a model for maybe other other efforts that they might not be able to get done in the mm -hmm. usual way. So what is the usual way and what was special about the Ottawa Treaty? Yeah, so the usual way um, for a lot of disarmament issues is um, what our executive director calls aim low and go slow, um, where you have to have um, consensus, meaning everybody has to agree. You don't get to vote and like majority passes something or, um, so a lot of UN bodies on disarmament issues operate under consensus rules, um, where they can be very strict, um, they don't often let civil society in, whereas the Ottawa process was a, if you wanna do this, join us, um, we're going to work with everyone who wants to do this. Civil society is going to be in the room um, because like the landmine survivors are going to be in the room because those are the people that know what's happening on the ground and know what these weapons do. Mm -hmm. It's the aid workers, it's the humanitarians, it's the people living with these weapons daily, The those that have um, been injured. They're the ones that sort of know what the problem is so we need them in the room um and it wasn't it wasn't a consensus it was a bit of a like everyone negotiates it and if you don't like it at the end we're going to adopt it by a vote um and you know if you don't like it you don't have to join it um but what's incredible is we've got the majority of the world now has joined it so there's 164 states that have joined it mm -hmm but almost every other state that hasn't joined it still sort of abides by the treaty anyways. Um, there's very few countries where the government themselves is using landmines in the last year. It was only Myanmar. Um, there had been previous use a couple of years ago by Syria, but for the most part, governments don't use landmines anymore. Um, it's only non-state armed groups uh, that are using landmines. So even though they didn't take part in the process or they didn't join the treaty, they're still all abiding by it. Looking as if they don't want to be ashamed of themselves. Is that part of it? That it, it becomes um, a norm uh, that just decent people don't do that. Exactly. Um, so what are the strengths of a strong civil society campaign and strong treaty with lots of government support is that um, landmines have been stigmatized so much that the idea of using them is abhorrent. Um, that countries will not do it, countries will deny using them if they have, um, they will do everything in their power to not be seen as using such a horrific ban. Well, what happened? Uh, what happened at the time was, uh, was it Lloyd Axworthy and, that's somebody in government to approve, and he, he held a big party and invited anybody who wanted to come, uh, all the countries that wanted to, and civil society organizations that wanted to send representatives could, could come to Ottawa and have a conference for a couple of days, or what happened? Yeah. Um, so it was, and when it was? was uh, so the first conference was in uh, 1996, in October 1996, and it was because 
civil society have been pushing governments to do something about the landmine problem. They've been gathering the data that you need, showing the, the scale of the problems, the scale of the suffering, um, reaching out to organizations everywhere, doing the, the like talks in church basements, going to schools, going everywhere, talking to people about this issue and creating a lot of pressure on the governments. Mm -hmm. um, and those UN bodies that operate by consensus tried to pick up the issue, but there was a few countries that were pushing back and they couldn't get anywhere um, really. So Canada was like, okay, well, let's, you know what? Let's go talk about this outside the UN at a meeting. We're gonna just, you know, talk about landmines, like-minded states, come on over. Um, so they had that meeting and it went well. And then at the closing remarks, um, Minister Axworthy shocked everyone, delighted civil society by putting out that, that challenge to uh, negotiate a treaty in the next year. And they made it, they went all over the world to negotiate. So there was negotiations that happened in Vienna. Um, there were regional meetings everywhere. There was negotiations in Oslo and I think Dublin and there were other negotiations. I think there were meetings in like Chile and um, Asia Pacific and Cambodia and everywhere. Um, and they came up with a text. It, it did take them 13 and a half months instead of exactly one year. Um, but then they came back to Ottawa on December 3rd, 1997 to sign the treaty. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Okay. Now, so there was a traveling team of negotiators. Uh, who were they? That went um, and talked in all of these places to different governments. Yeah. Right? Well, so they were, they were all government representatives. So different countries would host the meeting where they would get together to discuss the treaty text. Um, the International Campaign to Ban Landmans, the ICBL was present at all of these meetings. So it had representatives from like landmine survivors and affected communities and activists from all over the world there pushing for as strong a treaty as... And Mines Action Canada, your group, already existed well before then and was part of this uh, international campaign to ban landmines. And so y your group would have had something to do with, with this. Yeah, obviously this was way before my time. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, uh, Mines Action Canada had been formed in 1994. So we were... We were around, we were strong, um, taking part in those negotiations and obviously very excited when the treaty came back here to be signed. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that Mines Action Canada now is pushing for is for Canada to take on the presidency where you're in charge of the treaty for a year, you guide the treaty for a year so that Canada can bring the treaty back home to Ottawa for a meeting so that we it, one of the annual meetings can be held back here in Ottawa. This treaty is something you carry around depending on who's hosting a meeting this year. And you just um, actually have a depository state uh, where, where the thing is, uh, resides and, the, and you move it around to show it off or what? No, no. So the, the treaty itself is deposited with the UN. Um, so that's where if you want to sign it or if you want to ratify it, um, it's done there. Um, but like every year there's a meeting where it reports, we report on what's been done, assess the pro the progress, make plans, um, hear from other countries, ask countries that need assistance can ask for it. Countries that can offer assistance can offer it. Um, so whoever's in charge of that meeting is the president of the treaty and they get to, they do sort of all the planning for the year, help, uh, put forward, you know, different priorities, whether it's victim assistance one year or um, clearance or risk education and all these things. Um, and Canada's never taken on that role. I mean. Hmm, wonder why. I thought you guys at play from Ottawa play quite a major part in the international campaign, don't you? Uh, we do. So we're part of the governance board of the international campaign. Um, we are also part of the, the monitoring and um, research, the Landline Monitor, um, which is a civil society uh, publication that comes out every year that is essentially the, uh, 
the year in landmines. It gives country by country um, profiles, and then we also publish a thematic book um, on different issues that gives global overviews. And then on the website, there is um, country by country uh, profiles. So you can see exactly like what Canada has done this year, how much money Canada has given to um, what we call mine action. So clearing landmines, assisting victims, doing risk education, doing advocacy, or destroying stockpiled mines. Um, mm -hmm. That you can see, oh, that, you know, um, Cambodia cleared um, square kilometers of landmines, but there were five new casualties. Last year, you can see where the casualties were, where, who's still contaminated, who's making good progress um, on clearing the mines, because the treaty does have a 10-year deadline of you're supposed to clear all the mines in your territory within 10 years. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of countries came into the treaty with huge problems, and they, so they wrote in the possibility of extensions as long as it's a good plan. Um, so some countries um, are like doing their extensions. Some of them met their 10 year deadline. Some needed more time. Um, so that's one of the things that the, the meeting does each year is looks at the people that are asking for an extension and sees the plans that they've made and gives them feedback or decides whether or not the treaty, all the states approve of this plan. Mm -hmm. So this is a paper publication, a real book, like a coffee table book or something? You got well, and stuff? <laughs> it, it does have pictures. It's not like hard copper cover or anything super pretty to put on your coffee table. It's a lot of statistics um, and a lot of charts and lists and graphs and things. Um, but there are, yes, there are hard copies. Uh, could, could people get download stuff? Uh, do you have it online too? Oh, mo the majority of it is online. The part that is published in hard copy is just the sort of summaries. Mm -hmm. um, so the website is the-monitor.org. Say it so again. The-monitor.org. Have a look at that. I have it. Yeah. Maybe I should go have a look at it too. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. It's good stuff. This, this process broke the, the mold for how to get uh, treaty negotiated. And I've mm -hmm. heard other people say, well, we ought to try it with this other problem mm -hmm. that we have. Uh, yeah. How much, um, how far has that uh, emulation gone? Have um, other uh, campaigns attempted to um, use the same methods? And in a way, what are, what are the next, uh, what are the steps beyond the landmine mm -hmm. treaty would, that uh, people would like to to go to expand the, the general principle. Uh, yeah. For example, maybe, uh, maybe you want to talk about cluster munitions and what the connection is to cluster bombs and so on. Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so actually that is one of the, uh, one of the treaties that follow the, uh, the Ottawa process um, guide, so to speak. Um, so cluster munitions, which are large bombs with smaller bombs inside them, that open in the air and coat an area about the size of a football field with uh, explosives, um, which are you know very indiscriminate when they're in the air because you can't control where in a football field your bombs land. Um, and they also have a really high failure rate. So anywhere from five to 30% of what they call some munitions, so like the smaller bombs inside, um, fail to detonate when they hit the ground. So they become de facto landmines. Uh, so this weapon is um, very dangerous for civilians. Um, what we've found is that its casualty rates um, are about 90% civilian out of every, um, out of all the cluster munition casualties. So this is not an efficient um, weapon in any way, shape or form for fighting if 90% of the people killed and injured are civilians. Oh yeah. Well, where was it ever used? Um... So uh, where they're really known to be used was um, Laos and Cambodia during, or in, and Laos and Vietnam during the Vietnam War. Um, Laos was the most, one of the most heavily bombed countries in the world uh, in the 70s. Uh, we've also seen them being used uh, more recently. They were used a little bit in um, 
the Iraq war in the early 2000s, um, and then following that uh, conflict between Hezbollah and Israel and Lebanon. Um, and then most recently we've seen them used uh, in Ukraine, as well as then extensive- By whom? Um, the people that are, that are fighting that are not Ukrainian army. And they've also been used very extensively in Syria by the, uh, the Syrian government and, the, um, and sometimes the Russians. And then also were being used quite heavily in um, Yemen by the, the Saudi coalition. Was that going to be, or is it, a separate uh, treaty, uh, cluster munitions, or was it like a protocol uh, for the uh, landmines treaty, or how, how was the, what was the relationship going to be with the cluster yeah, munitions? so the Convention on Cluster Munitions is a completely separate treaty. Um, it did come about through a very similar process, but instead of Canada taking the lead on this one, it was Norway. And so, and the treaty is quite similar. Um, but it does have some de um, improvements, I think. Uh, the definition of who is a victim is very clear and what um, states need to do to assist victims is very nicely laid out as opposed to just being one line. It's, um, it's about 121, I believe, states that have either signed it or ratified it. Mm -hmm. um, and what's really nice is we're also seeing the same level of stigma on cluster munitions as we are on landmines. So uh, a friend that did, used to work, do a lot of NGO work at the UN in, in New York as part of the Cluster Munition Coalition, which is the international campaign um, to ban uh, cluster munitions, uh, which is full of uh, NGOs and civil society organization. And she often had to deliver statements to the UN um, condemning Syria's use of cluster munitions. And at one point, a, a Syrian diplomat came up to her and was like, could you please stop saying we're using those weapons? Um, even though we have extensive evidence that they were being used, but the idea that they were being, that they were being um, using such a horrific weapon was just a little bit too much for this diplomat to, uh, to handle. So he, he asked if we could still please stop saying that they're being used. Yeah, poor guys. You have to feel, feel pity for some of the negotiators when they, they have to deal with situations like that, representing their government when they're doing, government's doing horrible things. Which brings yeah. us to someone who has no shame whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, one uh, global politician who, more than any, any other quality, I think, is a person who is incapable of feeling shame. Mm -hmm. And therefore, anything that he can do, he will do and flaunt it and, mm -hmm. and just dare anybody to mock him or ridicule him or chastise him or even scold him because mm -hmm. he's not ashamed of anything. And that name uh, I will not personally utter at the moment, but the initials mm -hmm. are D.T., uh -huh. And we might talk about what that leader, that global leader, has done lately that would probably put you right off. And I imagine most of the people watching this, this uh, video. Yeah, so last week, Friday at the, uh, you know, Friday afternoon, um, the United States announced a new landmine policy. Um, this policy... Uh, recalls um, Obama-era uh, prohibitions on using landmines uh, outside the Korean Peninsula um, and allows the U.S. military to start planning for and using landmines. Now, I can only come up with questions, what in the hell are, do they have in mind, but go on. <laughs> yeah, so the United States has never joined the Ottawa Treaty. Um, what they, during the, they were part of the negotiations and what they wanted in the negotiations was a exemption for the demilitarized zone in Korea. Um, and they wanted an exemption for what they call um, non-persistent mines. Um, so those are mines that uh, apparently would self-destruct or deactivate after a specific time period. 
Now, but if you go back to what we were talking about at the very beginning of our conversation, um, how, what the definition of a landmine is. The, the definition of a banned landmine is one that is indiscriminate, that is detonated by the presence or proximity of a person without any um, ability to know who it was. So um, if they're, they only work for 30 days, but this the whole time that they're there, they're indiscriminate, they, anyone could set them off, they're still banned. Um, so how long they're valid it does not matter. Um, what matters is whether or not they're an indiscriminate weapon. And uh, what we're talking about here is indiscriminate weapons. Um, so, but one of the things, uh, President Obama got very close to the, uh, joining the Ottawa Treaty. Um, so the Obama policies uh, were no more production of landmines, uh, no use of landmines anywhere except for um, possibly in the Korean Peninsula. And, you know, the United States has always been one of the top donors to mine action, taking the landmines out of the ground and assisting victims. So all in all, like, the policy was pretty good. Like, it's not perfect. They need to join the treaty and they will eventually ban landmines in the United States. But this new policy from um, the Trump administration uh, is a giant, very dangerous step backwards. Mm -hmm. so what they're saying now is that the uh, uh, American military can use landmines again, which no one was asking for. Um, That's so interesting. Yeah, since this policy came out, um, we've seen like pretty much universal condemnation of it. Um, and most recently, I just saw an article from uh, an online publication called um, The American Conservative that has a weekly column on sort of international issues. And the headline was essentially, even the military doesn't want this. Um, <laughs> because uh, the landmines haven't been used by the American military since the Gulf War. And during that Gulf War, uh, they ran into a lot of problems where they ended up having to change direction and go different ways because they found, came across areas contaminated with their own landmines. Um, and you know you don't necessarily want a weapon that you can't control. And uh, what landmines are good for is killing civilians and injuring our but, own. Was this, do you suppose this is a, a demonstration of just showing the middle finger to the world? Uh, you've got a rule. Uh, n never mind whether it's a good rule or a bad one. It's a rule that I could violate, and therefore I'm going to violate it just to show you. I mean, what else motivation would there be? Is there any constituency in the American public, among voters, for example, people mm -hmm. who have anything at stake that would benefit from the uh, resumption of using landmines? Is there, uh, what pressures are there? In fact, I have to ask why Obama wasn't able to get the uh, or even try maybe I don't know uh, to uh, to get the thing endorsed. I suppose it was all about North and South Korea and the, the DMZ. Mm -hmm. but, um, was that a realistic consideration that you really couldn't maintain this horrible line between North and South Korea unless you put landmines there, or or was it um, what what are what are the political dynamics? behind the demand for the use or the curtailment of use of landmines? Yeah, um, so I don't think there was like, I don't think this was a voter issue in the United States of like bring back landmines and I will vote for you. I mean, I think using landmines is going to lose you some votes. Um, and we've seen that a lot of the, the Democratic uh, presidential candidates have all come out and said that they will, um, reverse this policy. Um, Who said that? Pardon? Who said that they would reverse it? Um, I believe almost all the um, Democratic 
uh, presidential candidates. Well, uh, but the Republicans will say, well, yes, sir, salute. You, you want them, so we'll go for it. Is that right? They, they back him on everything, so why not that? Yeah, I don't think I've heard any of the Republicans commenting either way on the policy. Um, but yeah, so there is the, the concerns about Korea, but I do not, my personal opinion is that it's not a valid concern. Um, they have a lot of other ways to um, protect uh, the South and uh, these indiscriminate weapons are not really gonna help anyone. Um, but uh, I think it's a little bit of a pushback on I don't want to lose anything um, option that sometimes mm -hmm. military planners don't want to give up stuff like that. Usually, if you talk to to the the boots on the ground, the men and women in uniform who are going to have to walk through walk on the land, nobody wants to deal with landmines. Um, you think this was just Trump himself? Oops, I said the word. <laughs> um, no, I think there was there was some um, some reviews through the Pentagon. Um, we're having a really hard time uh, sorting out where this came from, to be honest. Um, there are always people that don't want to um, to give up weapons, and it's very interesting that that article I mentioned. Um, uh, one of the articles that I saw this week on the commentary there was that the military didn't, the American military didn't care about landmines. They weren't being used. They don't need them, didn't really care about them until NGOs started speaking up. I see. When the NGOs started speaking up, we couldn't let, they couldn't let somebody else pick what weapons they're allowed to use. And so that's when they started pushing mm -hmm. to keep yeah. them in the arsenal. Okay. That that kind of solves my question about the psychology of the thing, you know, the social dynamics of why anybody bothered to try to do this. Okay, so what is what will be the response to this? How are you going to organize uh, an effort to block it? Uh, can you block it? But uh, well, let's see. It could be pa there could be a law passed in the House, couldn't there? But it wouldn't wouldn't clear the Senate. Uh, yeah. saying uh, forbidding landmines or requiring um, well they only the Senate has anything to do with treaties I think right anyway I am um, not an expert on American so politics what, what could be done and what you you folks are planning uh, yeah. as a way of responding to this yeah so um, I know our American colleagues are speaking out very strongly um, advocating very hard against this policy um, Humanity and Inclusion, which is um, an organization that does a lot of work with landmine survivors and other persons with disabilities. Um, they have a, an online petition um, right now, the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. Um, every campaign um, member organization has been asked to write the White House and to uh, request a meeting with the American embassies in their own countries. Um, here at Minds Action Canada, we've uh, written an op-ed this week um, explaining that Canada, in the face of this horrific policy, Canada should step up, um, reiterate that landmines are always prohibited, regardless of whether or not how long they are um, supposedly active for, because, like I said, it doesn't matter how long a mine is active for, it's banned if it's detonated by someone stepping on it, touching mm -hmm. it. Um, and that Canada should sort of retake our leadership role, step up on some funding, and uh, really make sure that we can finish the job on landmines. Mm -hmm. We've seen EU, I believe, Norway, Belgium, maybe not Norway, I know the EU, um, Belgium, I believe Germany, um, Sudan, who is this year's president of the treaty, they've all made statements um, sort of calling on the United States to... So there is uh, already mobilizing some sort of mm -hmm. effort to 
I, I don't know whether anybody has it. It's like the rest of the world doesn't even count in terms of, of Trump's policies. Uh, how much effect do you think it will ca have there uh, on uh, getting them to reverse that decision, if any? Um, it's always worth a try. And what's important is that we need to keep the stigma against landmines strong. Uh, one of my biggest concerns with this policy is that the, the users of landmines, the that are currently using landmines, whether it's ISIS or the Taliban or um, any of those sort of organizations could see this policy as an excuse for what they're doing. Um, so everyone speaking out so strongly in support of the treaty, condemning this, um, this new policy is very important um, to make sure that the United States this new policy doesn't provide cover to um, other users of landmines. Okay, well now what are, what are the odds that you can get the Trudeau government to take the strong stand that you seem to be encouraging? I uh, don't want to put odds on that, but we are doing a lot of, um, we're aiming to do a lot of parliamentary outreach in the next couple of weeks. Um, that was already planned, um, before this announcement was made. So hopefully um, we will uh, hear good news from, from Canadian parliamentarians. Um, what's really nice is that um, all parties in Canada strongly support the Ottawa Treaty. It's one of those sort of parts of Canadian identity um, internationally that is, um, looks good for all of us that, you know, we're the country that is that saved the world from landmines. Um, yeah, Jeanette Trudeau announced when he came into office, Canada is back, meaning mm -hmm. the, good, the good guy Canada is mm -hmm. uh, back in power. But, uh, you know, as I think even today's paper, somebody said, no, Canada hasn't really come back. But the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, actions that Canada has taken on peace issues, at any rate, has been very disappointing not uh, not very proactive and certainly not standing up to the u.s pressures mm -hmm. so uh since i believe canada is uh, trying to make a pitch uh again to be uh, appointed to the security council uh the politics of uh, getting uh, getting to look like uh, canada's back and is a good guy might have some influence i would like to think Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the two countries that we're running against for the Security Council seat, Norway and Ireland, are huge supporters of the mm -hmm. uh, Norway was president of the treaty last year for a review conference and hosted a, a pretty successful meeting where we have a new action plan to guide the next five years of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're looking for Canada. Canada doesn't have to do what some of the other countries have done and put out a statement condemning um the american policy that's going to cause problems for our uh, i'm sorry you said canada doesn't have to do that what no do you they don't have to put out a statement specifically condemning it they can do things to show their support without uh without naming names you can um march 1st is coming up which is the anniversary of the treaty's entry into force when the treaty became binding law canada can release a statement supporting like celebrating that. International Mine Action Day is April 4th. We can do things there. We can just tweet about the, um, the good programs that Canada is funding, clearing mines or assisting victims. Um, so there is ways to support the treaty without condemning the policy if that, pol if that condemnation is gonna cause us problems for, you know, uh, trade or mm -hmm. where we need to be a little bit more cautious than some of our allies because well they're our biggest neighbor and <laughs> when things go <laughs> wrong we <laughs> we notice uh, just a matter of which tone you take and if Canada wants to take a, a more general tone on the on Twitter it would be called subtweeting where you you comment on things without naming who you're really speaking to mm -hmm. We're, we can, if we have to subtweet about this, we can subtweet about this, but Canada does need to, to get on record somewhere. 
Now, what would you ask our viewers to do? Because I don't know who's going to be watching this. In fact, I hope maybe if you find this valuable, you can share it to other people who might mm -hmm. also want to learn from what you've told me, because I've learned a whole lot. Um, I, I thought I knew a little bit, but uh, I've learned more. Anyway, uh, if, you, if, you, uh, if other people want to share this, it's a great idea. And, and, but then, you know, what would you advise people who care about this to, to do to promote the cause of uh, the total abolition of landmines? Yeah, so I think there's a few things. Um, globally, uh, anyone can sign the HI petition. Um, if you, it should come up pretty easily if you Google um, humanity and inclusion landmines petition. Say it again. Um, it's the what petition? HI petition? Did you? Yes. Yeah, so the the petition being done by the organization Humanity and Inclusion. Um, they have a petition out on social media right now. Um, so you can look them up. There is branches in almost eight or ten countries. So you can find one near you that will should have the link to the petition on their website. But you will have it on Man's Action Canada too. Won't you? your website? Um, I can put it on there, but, uh, what, what should, uh, it's not our petition. It's not your petition. Okay. All right. No, but well, uh, so you want them to go to this something humanity and inclusion. Uh -huh. All right. I have not come across that Aaron. So they used uh, to be called uh, handicap international, but they've changed their name. Oh, okay. okay. HI, Humanity and Inclusion, um, that's, a, that's definitely a way to take action. Um, if you're outside the U.S., you could also write to your representative, your parliamentarian, um, and express support for the Ottawa Treaty. If your country hasn't joined the treaty yet, you should probably ask them to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you are in the United States, this is something where you can talk to your, your local representatives. Um, doesn't matter who they are, um, talk to them, tell them how this policy is upsetting you, that it's not safe for American per military personnel, it's inefficient, and it's exceptionally dangerous for civilians. Mm -hmm. um, what we always say is that, uh, you know, if you're trying to uh, move disarmament forward, you need to remember that um, good soldiers don't deserve bad weapons. And the landmines are one of the worst weapons out there. So well, again, bless you. you uh, I think that's the, the, the slogan we ought to end on. Landmines <laughs> are one of the worst weapons out there. Yeah. Well, there are some bad ones too. <laughs> I can think of a few. <laughs> like nuclear yeah. weapons. <laughs> Oh, oh, we work on those too. <laughs> well, we will work on those too, and I'm sure you do. You're a woman of uh, great courage, and you certainly are all over the world. I, you go off and do all these these trips to carry on the work, and I, I just admire you and uh, respect what you're doing so much, Erin. Thank you so much. So appreciate this, and we'll we'll try to get this word out. And uh, okay. great to be have you as my partner. Okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, but thanks for all the kind words and for having me on. All right, blessings. See you soon, one day, Aaron. Bye. Bye. This conversation is one of the weekly series, Talk About Saving the World, produced by Peace Magazine and Project Save the World. Please visit our website at tosavetheworld.ca, where you can sign the Platform for Survival, a list of 25 public policy proposals, that, if enacted, would greatly reduce the risk of six global threats to humankind. Come back next week for another discussion of a serious global issue.